All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Medigain ASC Billing Specialist webinar, A Strategy and Formula for Verifying Insurance Since the Affordable Care Act. I'm Clint Hughes, the VP of Marketing for Medigain. I will be your host and moderator this afternoon. Our presenter today will be uh, Ms. Christina Marson. She is the Director of Operations and Client Services for our ASC Billing Division, and she is our resident expert on how to safely navigate the turbulent waters that have come up since the Affordable Care Act. So, uh, Christina, if you are off mute, uh, we are recording, we are live, and ladies and gentlemen, we will be providing a recording of this webinar and the slides for you after the presentation. You can put questions in the question and chat box there on the side. We'll have a couple of polls. So uh, without any further ado, let me introduce you to Christina Marson. Christina? Hi, Clint. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us today as we discuss different strategies for verifying insurance, especially since the enactment of the Affordable Care Act. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to discuss some of the benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Why is this all getting dropped on us? Um, it's created the health insurance marketplaces. These established exchanges that offer patients the option of shopping around and comparing plans to select coverage that is affordable for them and their families. They're pushing transparency and patient involvement. They want these to be consumer-driven plans and have them know the ins and outs of their benefits. Those of us working on this side know that that's very difficult for the patients to keep up with. It also eliminated pre-existing condition waiting periods. In the past, patients with pre-existing conditions like diabetes or cancer that had any lapse of coverage exceeding 63 days would then be subject to a waiting period that would last anywhere from 6 to 18 months. And during that time, no services that applied to that condition were payable. Instead, the entire responsibility became the patient's. Now that continuous coverage is required for every individual, those types of clauses can no longer be enforced, allowing immediate coverage for all types of services. The ACA also made retroactive termination of coverage illegal. Previously, insurance companies could not only drop patients for a myriad of reasons, but they could go back in time and terminate the coverage as well as recoup all funds paid during that time. Except for in cases of fraud, those cancellations will no longer be legal or enforceable. ACA also ended benefit limitations. This applies purely to lifetime and annual benefits. Capitations per day are not only still permitted, but have been growing in frequency, and we expect that trend to continue. The Affordable Care Act will now allow dependents to remain on their parents' coverage until the age of 26. This adds more patients to the practice and coverage for people that weren't seeking it out previously. And lastly, requires free preventative care. And like all legislation, the intent has become distorted, and the insurance companies have manipulated the legislation, um, providing that free preventative care only to in-network providers. Many carriers are even considering it a non-covered service for out-of-network, not just that it won't be free to the patient. Next slide, please. What will be the impact of all of these changes? The health insurance marketplace allows patients to do research on costs and coverage, but it doesn't provide an avenue for providers to do the same. In fact, the exchanges that offer insurance will be through the same commercial companies that are already in the market. There may be no obvious way to distinguish the benefits selected through an exchange from traditional coverage. Initial review is indicating that some of these exchange plans will be limiting reimbursement to only 67% of the Medicare fee schedule. All of this will make, which will make your benefit verification and timely collections essential to your facility. Payment is due at the time of service. I know most practices have a similar statement posted in their lobby and maybe echoed in their financial statement, but how many are actually enforcing the policy? Ultimately, the goal for all offices should be to collect all applicable copays, deductibles, and coinsurance amounts before the patient ever sees the doctor. Your staff needs to be educated and well-equipped to perform the benefit verifications, provide an explanation to the patients, and enforce the policies to collect payment up front. Next slide, please. 
Why are upfront payments so important? In this example, we're looking at an outpatient surgery center that specializes in neurology. This particular facility is contracted and therefore has no choice about the amounts that they collect from the patients. Now, there is no reason that a, a contracted practice should not collect money up front. Uh, you should be reviewing your contracts and fee schedules regularly and should allow your office to have a matrix or schedule available to the staff that includes the contracted rate and the amount that would be due based on the patient's benefit level up front. In this example, you can see that 75% of the practice's revenue was applied to patient's responsibility in the form of coinsurance and deductibles. If this office did not collect these, up, these funds up front, their revenue would be limited to only 25% of the rate that they agreed to with the carrier. This is 25% of the limited fee schedule that they signed when they signed their contract. The schedule was sampled from claims with dates of service ranging from September 3rd to October 8th. Now that's important because typically we see benefits and deductibles wear out in February and March of the year. These are dates of service occurring in September. So three, uh, two thirds through the, the year and we're still having deductibles applied to these patients and no payments being remitted from the carrier themselves. The, uh, Due to the high deductible plans that are becoming increasingly common since the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, patients will still be paying out of pocket at the end of the year and may not ever have funds paid from their insurance company. How do we deal with that? Well, your first strategy for your office will be to smile. First, say hello and make eye contact. That initial greeting establishes an immediate connection with your office so that the patients know who they can trust and who they should seek out when they need their benefits explained. We want them to be comfortable with the office and know that your staff and your providers have their benefit at heart, not their insurance company. The next step in that is insurance verification. How often does your practice receive EOBs that say things like, this was not a covered benefit and was denied, or services have been rendered after a coverage termination? Insurance verification is one of the most pivotal and often the most neglected procedures in every office that I visit. It may seem time, con time consuming or even redundant, but a thorough benefit check at every visit may mean the difference between a payable claim and loss of revenue. The liability collection can be the most difficult to implement because it's uncomfortable. Um, in healthcare, we're trained to be compassionate for the patient and to care about them, and that's hard to do while you're asking them for their hard-earned money. Um, keep in mind that when the patient arrives for their import appointment, their concern is on their health. That's what's motivated them to come into your office and seek you out. They're willing to make payment, and they understand that payment up front is necessary part of healthcare. But once that your office permits the patient to leave without collecting any money, the debt they've incurred is now lumped in with their all of their other responsibilities, mortgage, groceries, car payments, gas, things that will look far more important than paying your office for their deductible down the line. Expectations. We want to set realistic and honest expectations with the patients up front to open communication early and help them understand that they can trust the doctor and the facility and, and can seek them out for guidance when they don't understand their benefits. Typically, when I hear from upset patients, it's not because they received poor care or they're upset about how their claim was processed. They're upset because they're shocked or surprised about the EOB that they received. Following this process will help to eliminate those surprises up front. Insurance verification, your best tool is PrEP. Prepare for everything. Even in offices that currently perform benefit verifications, we will want to review their policies and procedures to ensure that they are equipped to deal with all of the new changes. Just like collecting money up front, it's far easier to collect all of the demographic data and card copies during the first visit. At a bare minimum, you'd want to obtain the information on the left. Usually, this would be your scheduler when the patient calls to make their first appointment. But for best practices, you're going to want to obtain everything on the right. It may not seem important up front, but later when claim issues arise, tracking that information down from the patient can be very difficult, if not impossible. Some of the most important information listed on here may not even be the most obvious. 
Your staff can get much of this information off of automated systems and through website verification, but unless they know what they're looking for, they're not going to obtain the right information. Before making any calls, you should know if you're in or out of network, what type of benefit category you're calling for. Um, the insurance companies are very good at keeping that information away from you, and they'll use very subtle but effective tricks to do it. For example, when obtaining a benefit quote for an ambulatory surgery center, you may have to use different terms than you're used to in order for the representatives to locate the correct benefit level. For an ASC, you may have to say freestanding surgery center, outpatient hospital, non-hospital facility provider. You might even have to state what type of bill you're going to use before the representatives can accurately find the information you're trying to access. Outpatient surgery provided at the hospital may pay at a percentage of an allowed amount, while an ASC may have a fixed dollar maximum. If you asked for the wrong benefit category by just saying outpatient surgery, you would receive an inaccurate quote, and you're going to have problems down the line. You could wind up providing care to a patient whose benefits will never allow more than a couple hundred dollars for that particular admission. Next slide, please. Eligibility. Benefits should always be re-verified within the same month that services will be provided and the effective dates documented. This is especially important right now because patients who didn't just complete their open enrollment and start over in October will probably be restarting here in January. But there's also other plans to consider like unions or other contract year plans that run from month to month or July to June. And without that information, the quote that you're giving that patient may not be valid. Outside of enrollment, benefits can change for a myriad of reasons. Employers switch carriers for cheaper rates. Members may neglect to make payments or simply lose their employment. Another effect that will feel from an Affordable Care Act is that coverage will not always be linked to their job before job anymore. Therefore, patients may shop around and change coverage each and every year. So the benefit verification you perform this year may not be valid next year or even for the same company. The relationship to the provider, patient's relationship to the member is very important also. You want to ensure that the payer that is identified by the member up front is truly the liable party for the claim. Um, for example, a mom brings a child in for care and presents Aetna coverage. Your staff verifies the benefits, determines there are no limitations, and you proceed with care. But later we learn that the doc, the Mother's insurance is actually secondary to Dad's Blue Cross policy, which limits the benefits to only $380 per day. Even though we did the work up front, we didn't verify which the coordination of benefits, who was primary and who was secondary, and now you'll have a claim that can be paid at no more than $380. In many cases, by the time that mistake is discovered, we may be past timely filing. There may not be an avenue to seek a retro authorization, or there may be a limitation you weren't aware of, and that claim could end up being caught in a delay of processing or not payable at all. Next slide, please. To obtain the correct benefit information, you'll need to be familiar with the types of plans out there. These are going to grow in number as the changes pile on, but these four are the most common. It's important to note here that the HMO would require a contract, so if you're in network, you still may not be participating with a specific HMO. It's important for in-network facilities to know the ins and outs of those contracts, who they're participating with, how the claims are filed, and what the requirements of those contracts are. For HMO, referrals are required for everything, authorizations required for everything, and that care should all be coordinated through the primary care physician that the patient elected at a time of enrollment. The PPO and POS benefits both share that they have out-of-network benefits available. The POS may require a referral because that type of service allows patients to elect either their HMO coverage or PPO coverage. The EPO is an exclusive provider organization, typically sold to young, healthy people. Um, I see it most with students. And it, it requires very strict referrals. Typically, specialist care is not covered. Um, it's considered more of a catastrophic plan that will cover them in case of emergency or hospitalization. But it doesn't cover routine visits um, or outpatient surgery, typically. Next slide. 
Your staff will also need to be well-versed in the terminology and comfortable explaining them to the patients. Most patients don't know what these things mean. If they've heard them at all, that definition in their mind is mixed in with all of the misinformation that is spread in media and that they see from their insurance company. They're told that they will owe more and more money to out-of-network providers, less to in-network providers, and that may not always be the case. But you won't be able to tell unless you know these benefits terms and can understand how they apply. Your copay is a flat fee required to access benefits. Now, this is typically reserved for in-network only, and it's meant to remind the patient that there is cost sharing in all healthcare. A deductible is an amount that the patient must pay before benefits are available. Until that dollar amount is reached, no benefits are payable. The only exception to this will be preventative care or things that don't apply to the deductible. But in most cases, especially for ambulatory surgery centers where we're providing outpatient surgery, a deductible will almost always apply. Coinsurance is the percentage of the allowed amount that the plan has determined to be the patient's responsibility. This will vary. There will be different benefit levels. What's important for your staff to remember is the patient selected that level. They probably had an option of two or maybe three different levels of coverage, and they selected which percentage they wanted to be responsible for. They may have made, maybe may have made that decision based on premium costs, but it is still a decision that they made. They have a contract with that insurance company to pay those amounts. Out-of-pocket or stop-loss, this is something that gets very confusing for patients and providers, and as the benefit changes have started to roll out, it's becoming different on every single plan. It's a maximum amount that the carrier can require the patient to pay out-of-pocket. After that amount has been reached, the plan must reimburse 100% of the allowed amount. On out-of-network coverage, we are starting to see these slip away patients are always held liable for a certain percentage of the allowed amount. In the examples listed here, the in-network coverage was an 80-20, the plan responsible for 80 and the patient 20, and the out-of-network was 70-30. Both providers billed at $1,000 with the plan allowing the same amount, 750. The deductible application was the same. The payment was based on that benefit level with the coinsurance being applied to the patient. What is an important distinction to make here is your patients are going to be told that for out-of-network care, they are always responsible for that 250 in non-covered amounts, otherwise known as the balance bill. I've come across very few out-of-network providers that actually hold their patients responsible for that amount. And so in this example, the difference between in-network and out-of-network is $50 if they accept the same allowance not the 650 that your patients are constantly told that they will have to pay if they use their out-of-network. Out-of-network does not always mean more expensive. Next slide, please. Accumulations. I have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of benefits that allow cross-accumulation. They combine in and out-of-network, basically allowing the patient to kill two birds with one stone. It does not always cross-accumulate in to out-of-network, but when I've seen them, out to in does combine. So when a patient sees an out-of-network provider, they're getting credit on both sides of the deductible plan. This is another factor that may help contribute to the patient's understanding that it is not always more expensive to be going out-of-network. Ask if the deductible applies to the out-of-pocket, helps the re patient reach that out-of-pocket faster. That means that they then have no responsibility out of their own funds. And always check if the benefit level does increase to 100%. As I said, out-of-network, I've seen this slip away. Um, and when that happens, it can create a very large hardship for the patient and burden. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. One of the biggest changes we are going to be seeing, and I'm sure you've already had some exposure to them, are the high deductible health plans, also known as consumer-directed health plans. These plans have much lower premiums, but in turn have very high deductibles, um, where deductibles used to range from five to $1,500. These are starting at 4,500 and ranging to 15,000. To help manage the increasing deductibles, patients may have the option of using a flexible spending account. 
Many people know these terms but don't understand them. Your patients that have elected them most likely will. Even at times I see the carriers don't understand the plans. A health savings account or an HSA is a patient contribution account. They can apply their pre-tax salary to pay for eligible medical expenses. This type of account is owned and managed by the patient and transferable. If they lose their job or change jobs, it goes with them. A health reimbursement arrangement, or an HRA, is an employer contribution, not the patient. The account's dedicated to the patient to use towards eligible medical expenses, but it does not transfer with them. The carriers will rarely have the balances to these, but your patients will. The most difficult part of providing benefit quotes can be identifying how the allowable rate will be determined. When the patients call due to ACA, they're going to be asking how, what their balance is right up front. They want to know so they can shop around, call their providers, and compare benefit quotes. To be able to get that information, you're going to have to understand the different types of allowances and pricing methodologies. For in-network, it will be based on a fee schedule. Their rates developed by the plan, they can change by the plan without any notice that you did agree to them when you signed a contract, and that's what will be held to on your side and the patient's side. Contracts don't allow providers to negotiate or change those rates. If it's applied by the carrier, you must collect. Out of network, though, has multiple options for pricing methodology, and every carrier and every plan has different ways of processing them. In recent years, the most frequent and common has been the usual customary and reasonable, or reasonable and customary. This rate's based on statistically credible information derived from a comparison of fees charged by providers of equal specialty within the same geographic area on, during the same time frame. It's very difficult to determine the actual allowed rates under these plans because the plans don't actually even know. Uh, when you verify coverage, they'll tell you they won't know until they receive the claim and see the charges and configure their geographic area. Uh, in 2009, there was a lawsuit against company Ingenix, which is a subsidiary of United Healthcare, and they found that Ingenix used flawed data to intentionally lower the reimbursement based on usual and customary. The lawsuit settlement established a nonprofit to replace Ingenix, but it is actively still in use and has not yet been replaced. The AMA believes that usual and customary should take much more things into account, like the provider's training, the nature of services, prevailing rate by other providers, and then any unusual circumstances in the case. There shouldn't be a flat fee for every code because every surgery has different things that happen during it, different complications, and without allowing reimbursement for that, you're treating every patient as if it was exactly the same, and that's just not the case. We are seeing increasing benefit limitations. These are caps that are assigned to the outpatient facility out of network. It's stated that it's not any type of penalization, but the facts seem to speak to the contrary. The Affordable Care Act eliminated annual and lifetime limits, but did nothing to address daily limits. Some of them are as low as $350 or $380 um, in Blue Cross California plans. We see both a $380 and $540 level. Blue Shield, $350 to $600. Aetna, $400. HealthNet, $350 to $600. And many of the unions have began to cap their benefits at $1,000 per day for all outpatient services, and that would be combining the anesthetic and the professional charges. The most common that's starting to surface is the MNRP, or Medicare-based rate. This rate limits the percentage, limits reimbursement to a percentage of Medicare, usually between 110 and 150. I have seen it as high as 300%, but it's still based on Medicare rates. Next slide, please. Well, let's put that into a little bit of perspective. Okay, we'll put that here into uh, perspective in just a little bit. Right now, we are going to take a brief poll. So uh, let me launch the poll because we have different kinds of uh, setups. So 
the first poll that we're going to be having today is um, ownership about your ASC or your practice. Is it uh, privately owned? Is it owned by a hospital group? Or is it owned by a combination of the two? We're letting Christina grab a sip of water there and uh, sue those golden pipes there. So um, right now we've got about 70% of the people have voted. And we'll be bringing Christina back to you here shortly. And we'll give you about 15, 20 more seconds. There's the poll. Um, is it uh, owned by a combination of both, by a hospital group, or is it owned by the um, physicians there operating out of that ambulatory surgery center? So I'm going to close the, the poll here in four, three, two, one. And um, we are going to be able to uh, give you the result. It looks like about 65% uh, are physician owned and 32% are owned by a combination of the two. So Christina, it's back to you. One more quick note before moving on to this slide. On the CAPS, uh, when you're out of network, which is where this capitation will be applied, you're free to work on a blended billing strategy with the patient that allows you to make sure that you've covered your costs, set a price that you'll accept, and have the patient pay that up front. It can be very difficult to navigate, and we would be happy to help you coordinate that with your staff. Um, at the end of the presentation will be contact information provided. And if any of this information is something that you would like more help with, please just let us know. So to put the Medicare rates into perspective, these are the premium and deductible averages for Medicare versus the commercial plan. Medicare for Part A, um, most people pay zero. Very, very few are paying the 426 a month. Um, and the inpatient hospital deductible is only if they're admitted to the hospital, and that can be for up to 30 days of treatment. Part B requires only $104.90 a month premium with $147 deductible per year. In contrast, the commercial benefits are currently averaging at about $16,351 with over 4500 of that coming directly from your patient. Uh, and that still has deductibles ranging to 10000 I put this in before I started seeing higher ones. Um, I've seen in the last couple of days ones ranging all the way up to 20000 for an individual deductible. So the insurance company gets to base the rate that they pay on Medicare, but the amount that comes out of the patient's pocket isn't based on the same formula. The consumers aren't getting what they're paying for. Unfortunately, much of the Affordable Care Act puts that responsibility on the patient. Um, the commercial plans Sorry, I lost my space here. Um, plain and simple, the coverage isn't going to be there for the patient. In the coming years, all of that responsibility to dispute the level of payment will shift to the patient, not because we as providers don't want to help them, but because we won't be allowed to. Carriers are already restricting communication with providers in some areas and are requiring the patient's filed appeals directly. And this places a very unfair burden on the patient because this can be a very complicated process that they don't know the ins and outs of and will end up with them owing much more money than they ever intended. Next slide, please. So as patients come into your office and you need to collect money up front from them, we want to help them understand that we are there not only to collect their money, but help them understand how that was applied, why it was their responsibility in the first place, understand the terms, and assist your patients through that process so that they don't feel alone and turn to their insurance company that is just going to tell them that you're the problem. It's the doctor's fault that care is so expensive when we know that that is not the case. We want to take time to let them know that we do not agree with what their carriers are doing and that we want to help them access the benefits that they're already paying their hard-earned money for. Let the patients know you have their back, that you, they can call you first and you will help them through this process, not just collect their money. Patients are going to be shopping around and they want to see that things are transparent. Um, it comes off as that 
providers are trying to hide things, and that's what the notices that go out to your patients say, that your doctors are the problem. Help them understand that's not the case. Uh, it's pivotal that your staff understand all of these trends and can explain it in detail. Next slide, please. To help encourage transparency, it's important. It's important to keep these things in mind, that the patient chose those benefits and agreed to the terms with the carrier before they ever stepped into your practice. They do expect to pay something up front. And that even if you collect just a small amount on the first day of visit, it helps remind them that they do have a balance. You won't get as many complaints through the patient says, well, they told me they'd accept my payment in full or the insurance payment in full. But remember, they had to pay up front. And why would that have changed anything? Anything up front, even a small amount, like 10 or $20, reminds the patient that they have a cost sharing. Next slide, please. Establish written policies. Have patients sign and acknowledge that they understand, but be sure to use language that conveys your intent to help guide them through the process, but also reiterates that payment is part of their treatment. We know that all providers are committed to providing the best care possible, and patients do understand that, but they may get blindsided by some of the EOBs when they show up. And so it's better for them to have an idea up front of what their expectations should be. Next slide, please. Okay, we have another uh, quick poll here because as we've heard during this presentation, it is very important to collect uh, some of a lot of the fees up front. So one uh, this next poll is going to be uh, about um, your staff and are they incentivized to collect your cash and to hit your monthly goals? So um, is your staff incentivized to be sure that you are reimbursed all the all the money that that you are due so we'll do a quick little bowl because it, it's important if they are incentivized to help collect uh, probably have a chance of collecting more or if the, the service provider that you're using so um, right now about 75% uh, of you all have voted we'll leave it open for about uh, 10 more seconds. Boy, this is even better than American Idol. This is in real time. So we'll leave it open for about 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So uh, it's about half and half as far as um, the staff being incentivized to help collect. So that, that's pretty interesting. Um, Christina, back to you, uh, continuing on your program. Thank you. When payments can't be made in full up front, you want to have parameters established for your practice for payment plans. Having patients sign a promissory note reminds them of their responsibility. Um, and it, at the, I tell patients and providers to uh, ask the patient first what they can afford to pay. Most of the time, they're going to pick a rate or a time frame that's shorter than the amount you would have offered. Because we're trying to be compassionate caregivers, we want to make it seem attainable for them, and they will take care of that balance. You said they understand they have a responsibility. Most of my practices require an initial down payment of at least a third of the balance. You want to get as much of that out of the way so that the patient's making reasonable payments that they can handle going forward, but you don't want that to exceed a certain time frame. Um, I would recommend no more than six months. You don't want balances rolling into the next benefit year where the policy change and starts over. Um, they'll never clear their balance with you. At the very least, require a minimum monthly payment, even if it's something small, just to keep the patient involved. Um, and when possible, automate that process. Set it up as a recurring withdrawal or a credit card. You can even have them put a credit card on file up front so that they understand if they miss payments or if they don't establish for a recurring withdrawal, that that payment's going to come off a credit card anyway. Now, if you're a network, I would highly 
recommend looking through your contracts and determining what you're allowed to do and save before establishing any of these policies. But out of network, you can even offer a slight discount for allowing the patient to set up a recurring withdrawal. Um, but review what the terms of your agreements are before doing that. A good backup plan is always care credit or other financing. The provider receives their payment right up front, and the patient gets to break those payments out over to something that might be more manageable for them. Next slide, please. When payment plans fail or they aren't advisable for the patient, they're either not able to do them, they're on a fixed income, um, or it creates a, a burden or hardship, you can implement single case agreements that include some hardship waiver. Now, those policies should be considered case by case and not applied across the board. Um, you're in the best situation to know what's good for your patients. They will share with you when they're struggling and let you know what they can afford. Most patients want their doctors to be paid. That's who takes care of them. They have no problem with that, but it may be too much for them considering many of the benefit changes that will burden them in the next couple years. If you provide a hardship, for a hardship waiver, please include some sort of statement that goes through what information would be necessary to obtain it. For things like Medicare or contracts, you'll want to revisit those agreements and see what you're permitted to do. But for even out of network, it should require the patient to have some sort of evidence that it is a burden and that will keep it from being applied to too many patients and reserved for patients that actually have a hardship and cannot make payment. Otherwise, payments should just be broken up and made more accommodating, not eliminated altogether. Remind patients that all of that information is confidential and would never be shared. They can be very uncomfortable with sharing their household financial information with you, but when they understand it's for their benefit, typically we provide with no issue. Next slide, please. Like I said previously, I can't remember the last call I got from a patient that actually was to complain about the way they were treated or the way their care was handled. Almost every single call comes in and patients state that they were shocked with the billed amount or the amount applied on an EOB, that they didn't know a certain provider or aspect of their bill would be considered not covered or out of network. And it, I think it's easier right up front to let them know what bills will be associated with that service for their visits, if there's going to be lab fees or blood draw fees for surgery, inform them that there's multiple bills that will be received, a facility fee, a surgeon's fee, anesthetic fee. When possible, and the billing, if the billing isn't provided by the same entity, provide them with the contact information up front so they know that there's nothing trying to be hidden. You're not trying to sneak the anesthesiologist past them. You just have no control over how they bill. And if that's stated, I've never seen an issue where the patient didn't understand that. Next slide, please. Other expectations to set with the patient would include the physician financial interests. This is something the insurance companies are pushing as a, your doctor is trying to scam you. Um, and it, it comes off that way in the documentation that they provide the patient. A lot of insurance carriers are starting to require there be a disclosure and signature by the patient. And the wording that is selected by the insurance company slants it to sound like the doctor is trying to take your money and not provide care, that they'll put a nurse practitioner in to take care of you and cash your check. And we know that's not the case. But if you include statements like referrals should be made based on should be made based on the needs of the patient and the medical standard of care in order to provide quality health care, best practice is to offer an option of referral to a provider that would not have ownership, but educate your patient why you believe this is the best course of treatment for them. Especially at ambulatory surgery centers, there's so many benefits to the patient scheduling there instead of the hospital. Um, locations can be more convenient, scheduling can be easier to coordinate, there's not emergency care that could come in and swipe the surgical suite or any other schedule disruptions for that matter. The cost may be lower, even with increasing costs for the ASCs and trying to balance that, it's still much cheaper than a hospital stay. And the direct physician involvement is something that I don't think can be matched by any other policy. 
um, having your doctor being the one that decides how much you owe at the end of the day and how that's broken out instead of a board of directors or an insurance company is care that I would select every single day. Uh, and I don't find that patients have a problem with that either. They want to know that the doctors are involved. They just want to know why. From the insurance angle, it sounds like it's all for money. But have your staff educate them that it's not just money. These doctors are taking a huge risk, taking on a huge financial burden, and they do it for the betterment of the care of their patients. Next slide, please. The last disclosure that I would recommend would be something stating that you are out of network. It is the primary complaint that I get from patients. They had no idea someone was out of network. Um, and having them sign up front that they understand that, again, educate the patient. Let them know that you can send them somewhere in network. But if you've done your benefit verification, you, can, you should be able to show them exactly what the difference will be between the benefits. The benefit of being out of network is that you're not contractually obligated to build the patient exactly the way the insurance company tells you you should in-network doctors are. If you're contracted, you have to. You're obligated. If they change that in the middle of the year and decide that the money needs to be collected differently, you have to go along with it. Out of network, you don't. You can tell the patient that. Let them know. We will work with you. If this becomes a hardship, that is something that we manage here. It's been applied by your insurance, but we're the ones actually taking the loss when we don't collect that money from you. And like I stated, it's best to help them break it up to accommodate them, not to waive it. But when you're out of network, you're not contractually obligated to do anything. Next. Uh, here is the contact information I promised earlier. Um, we've discussed quite a few forms and matrices and things that we should be able to help provide you um, and your office to help them verify benefits and understand the terms and use of those benefits. Um, at this time, we'll do questions. Yes, uh, and so folks, uh, there it is. You have that slide there toward the end, um, and that's John dot Denton at metagain dot com, uh, so that you can send him any additional questions. The webinar is being recorded, and we are going to provide you a copy of the recording. We'll also provide you a copy of these slides. Um, and as I'm sorting through some of these uh, questions, Christina. Can you give us kind of like a real life situation, you know, complete walkthrough of uh, because you're there in the trenches uh, with the people there in the practices. So somebody walks in to do um, XYZ procedure and their deductible is such and such. Kind of walk us through what that, uh, how that old process went and how it is changed now from what it was maybe a year ago. Do you have any um, pertinent recent examples of that? Um, not, a, not a particular example, but benefits definitely um, have become more specified to the category and benefit level than they used to be. Um, it used to be a very generic check. You could check the date that coverage was effective, make sure that your patient was active, and then get the, the benefit level, if it was going to be 80-20 or 60-40, and that's really all you needed to know. Allowances were based on a, the build amount, um, so you didn't have to go into detail with how will you figure out what the allowed amount will be. When you receive these quotes of benefits, that is what will be stated. You'll say, they'll tell you that it'll be provided at 70% with the patient being responsible for 30%, but they won't tell you percent of what. Um, I find frequently that the people that you're getting the quote from will have no idea. They have to put you on hold and check with a supervisor, but don't let them off the hook. Make sure they find something in writing out of the patient's evidence of coverage or summary plan document that states exactly how that's going to be defined. It's required by law that it be defined in there, and there should be no reason they can't provide that quote to you and let you know. Um, that will allow you to determine up front if services are going to be based off a percentage of Medicare, can you afford to take that? Is there a device or implant that's going to exceed that Medicare allowance and, and outprice the surgery um, where it might benefit the patient and the provider for that patient to go to the hospital or be in network? Excuse me. Are you okay? I, I am sorry. 
Uh, next question. Okay, uh, I think uh, here's one that came through, and, and you may have addressed it. It says um, uh, that that they are having difficulty collecting deductible amounts due to the dynamic nature of the deductible amounts and claims in process to be paid. What's the best place for collecting deductibles and copays? Copays are very straightforward. So with the deductibles, it can be very difficult knowing what's been applied. Um, a lot of provisions in the High Tech Act and the, the previous enactment um, require that those pieces of information be up to the date. So when you're calling and receiving accumulations of deductible, it should be through that day that you're verifying. If it's not, you can always let the patient know as a disclaimer, you know, this could change. And, and truthfully, that disclaimer should always be stated to the patient that the benefit quote we're providing to you is based on information at this time. There's no way to know exactly what will be applied by the carrier. And in that case, if things change, contact us. Let your patient know that, that you should be their first call. If things don't go the way that we planned for them to go, contact us first and we'll sort it out. Okay. Uh, one, uh, do you have a form for insurance verifications so that they can compare it to what that they are, are using now? I, I do, and I'd be happy to provide that um, if they contact John there and, and specify that that's the information that they're looking for. Um, I tailor my benefit verification forms for the practice so that the questions that are asked on the form um, directly go to that type of service. So if you're involved in preventative medicine or um, different types of reconstructive surgeries, that that particular information is listed there and you're not just doing a general benefit quote. Um, so if they, if they contact us, I'd be happy to either exchange that or even review the form that they're currently using um, against the type of practice it is and, and make recommendations. Okay, great. Um, Christina, what is your suggestion on how to handle patients who have a grace period for unpaid premiums? I'm actually not very familiar with that. Um, so they, I think I would need some more clarification before I could comment. Okay. So uh, I'll tell you what, Jamie, uh, spell that out a little bit more in an email and send that to John. And uh, between John and Christina, we'll be able to uh, answer that for you. Okay, here's another question. Uh, an out-of-network facility with a Medicare Advantage plan. Okay, should, should they treat the patient as out-of-network and collect any deductible and coinsurance based on Medicare fee? So that's where your verification is going to be very important in determining how they structure that plan. If they follow all Medicare policies and procedures, it may be necessary to go to the Medicare rates. Um, a lot of these Advantage plans will even treat it as if it's in network regardless of your status with the company. And your best course of treatment is going to be to contact the carrier and find out exactly how it's laid out before providing any type of quote to the patient. If it is restricted to Medicare and the same Medicare rules apply, you have to follow those rules. Um, and so they'll usually be an 80-20, similar to the Medicare rates. Okay. So um, for people that are out there now, what would you say um, over the past, because you've been doing this for a few years, what would you say has become the, uh, the this has basically become like the, the number one hot button now. Are the people coming in with a very high deductible plans and then how do you work around that? Wouldn't you say that that's bubbling up to the surface more and more? Absolutely. Um, it's going to be rare in the coming years to see plans that aren't high deductible plans. Um, part of the Affordable Care Act required an 80-20 rule um, that mandated that the insurance companies use 80% of premium collections directly in health care, not administration or any other costs. Um, to do that, they've lowered the premiums, but to keep it affordable, uh, and I, I, I quoted affordable, um, for the carrier, 
they raise those deductibles. Now, the, the best treatment is going to be the patients that have elected those reimbursement accounts. Um, that's money that they're saving up throughout the year. It's not as noticeable to them, um, and it's pre-tax. So they get a little bit of a bump benefit there. Um, and the patients are your best communication there. Don't worry about talking to the insurance companies once that's involved. Talk to your patients um, and find out what balances they have available, how it's been applied, what eligible expenses under that plan are applicable to you, um, and, and help them use those benefits. Most people do not understand these yet. Um, and as time goes on, they are going to be more and more used because people cannot afford the deductibles that are being applied to them. Um, Ten to $15,000 on top of the $15,000 that's already being paid in premiums is a burden for anybody. Um, and that's where you're going to want to monitor the hardship that it's putting on your patients and help them navigate exactly what they can owe and what can be broken out and what you're going to have to take as a loss because it cannot be paid. Um, okay, Christina, we just got a few more minutes left. So um, in an overall sense, because we've uh, covered a lot today about how you should communicate with the patients, how you should communicate with the insurance companies, how does your team there at Medigain AC Billing Specialists how much burden do you take off of the shoulders and the backs of the people there at the ASC in dealing with all this? Kind of an overview, uh, a, a big 360 picture of the services that Medigain ASC billing specialists provide. So I, I prefer to, to teach and educate the offices. Um, when we first start up with a, a new client, we do um, some role playing and some training right up front. And then um, I, I usually ask that they do a couple benefits and I do the same ones and make sure that we got the same answers. Um, but I find it's best for the staff that's there in the office to understand every aspect of that and not rely on an outside source. If a patient walks in and needs treatment and you can't reach your billing, um, you need to know how to verify these benefits and, and what's important about it. And the verification process since it is so dynamic and constantly changing, unless you're doing them regularly, you won't know what to listen for and what kind of questions to ask. Um, but we spend a great deal of time with um, brand new accounts going over the process and educating your staff, because it's going to be your staff that has to deal with the patient. Um, I tell my staff, if you get off the phone with a benefit verification and you don't feel like you could answer a very angry patient who is calling and crying and yelling, then call again and make sure that you understand the benefits and could explain them to anyone. And so, but Medigain AC Billing Specialist, uh, your specialty is being able to do the billing to the insurance companies to be sure that uh, the, the ASCs get the maximum amount of reimbursement, that everything is filed in there correctly and flow through so that uh, overall your generating, I mean, uh, it seems like uh, a lot of times you increase the revenue coming into an ASC by like 20, 30, 40 percent, correct? Absolutely. And a lot of that in, in coming years will be coming from the patients. And to help set that up, we do extensive training with staff to make sure that they understand and can comprehend and relate with the patients and, and really know what's going on and how it affects them. Well, they're the front line, but you're behind them, keeping them up to speed on all the developments that are changing in regards to how they're billing. And, and you give them the ammunition so that that level of expectation is set. And so you're meeting the expectations not only of patient care, but also of the financial responsibilities. So there's less of this miscommunication and trauma down the road, right? Exactly. As we learn of new trends, um, which we're constantly watching for, um, we find that a, a certain Blue Cross plan has cut their benefits down to a percentage of Medicare across the board. We notify all of our providers and let them know, make sure you're careful scheduling this one. This type of plan um, has significantly reduced their allowances, and if you're using high dollar devices or high cost procedures, you're not going to recoup it from the insurance company that would be burdened on the patient. Um, and we also help provide them with 
um, some of the, the forms and documents to navigate that. Um, in that case, an advanced beneficiary notice would be required or an ABN um, that lets the patient know up front these services or devices may not be covered and you might be held liable for them in that event. Um, and that allows the facility to take an accounting of what the cost going into the procedure was and compare it to the rate that they actually received, but still allows them to bill the patient. I said, I just recommend that that notice be given up front so they're aware this might happen. I mean, like I have reiterated a few times, the patients know that this is going to be their responsibility, and when it's fully explained and disclosed to them, I rarely see them arguing. They just want to know how we can make it accommodate their financial situation. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for your expertise for today's webinar. Folks, you do have uh, John's email ad address up there and the phone numbers. Feel free to uh, shoot him any additional questions. To all the attendees, we will be sending out uh, later on today or tomorrow a link to this recorded webinar plus a copy of the slides for all of you. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Christina, who is our Director of Operations and Client Services for our ASC Billing Division. So uh, thank you very much, and also let us know we will have more webinars coming up in the near future to help you navigate the changes in the Affordable Care Act. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you.